Faithful Baptist Church in Pretoria. It's Sunday just after 10 a.m. and we have been listening to a Deste Fidelis that carries a Creative Commons license. Thank you for joining Pastor France and the Faithful Baptist Church. Father God, may you guide and help us today in our studies as we look at the Sermon on the Mount, part 7. And we're only looking at verses, chapter 5, verses 43 to 48 today. There are so many verses in the Sermon on the Mount, but we just want to try to understand these few verses properly before moving on to the next few verses. I pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount, and it's part 7, and it's Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. 
Now, what you can say is that today's teaching is goes a little bit deeper than the previous teachings. You could call it a little bit of a more meaty teaching, and it's all to do about love. It's to do with love. So let's read the passage we're going to study. Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor, but hate thine enemy. Verse 44. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans do the same? Verse 47. And if you salute your brethren only, what do ye do more than others? Do not even the publicans so? Verse 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father, which is in heaven, is perfect. And so where the meekiness comes in is where Jesus says that we must be perfect, as our Father in heaven is perfect, and this is to do with the aspect of love. Now the Jewish teachers, by neighbor, understood that only those who were of the own country, nation, and religion, in other words, only Jewish people, <laughs> and whom they were pleased to look upon as their friends. So that group of people was their neighbors. Now the Lord Jesus Christ teaches that we must do all the real kindness that we can do for everybody, not only the narrow definition of our neighbors, but we must expand the neighbors to everybody. Everybody on the earth is our neighbor, and especially to the souls of our neighbors. We must pray for them. While many will, will render, good for good, and that is just ordinary people. If somebody does something good for them, they'll do something good in return. But we as born-again Christians, we are to render good for evil that's done against us. And this speaks a much nobler principle than most men act by, and that is simply good for good. Others will Salute their brethren and embrace those of their own party and those of their own way or way of thinking, their own opinion. But we must not confine things to only those. We must open it up to much bigger. So it is the duty of Christians to desire and aim at and press towards perfection in grace and holiness. Wow, that's, that's a big concept. <laughs> and therein, we must study to conform ourselves to the example of our Heavenly Father. Surely, more is to be expected from the followers of Jesus Christ than from other people in the world. Surely, more will be found in the born-again Christians than in others. 
And what do you think? Do you think that's true? <laughs> Let us beg of God to enable us to prove ourselves as his children by loving our neighbors, which includes even our enemies as ourselves. So now let's just drill down into things a little bit more and we go verse by verse. And let's go to the first verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. That's the end of the verse. And just as a matter of interest, it never said in the Old Testament that you must love your neighbor and hate your enemy. We will try and understand where that came from. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. So this, and hate thine enemy, this is more of a clause that was given by the rabbis and by the teachers of the law, the scribes, and added to the former part, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. And so this is an important thing to show in how our Lord Jesus Christ deals with what was happening and being taught in the synagogues. So he's actually dealing with the teachings in the synagogue more than as in the law itself. What Jesus is actually saying is what's being taught in the synagogues is no longer in compliance with the law. And so he's trying to bring us back into line with what was originally taught in the books of the law and the prophets the first five books of the Bible and the books of the prophets. And where the confusion comes in and where they've taken liberty to teach us wrong doctrine, you can say it might come from. Now, the Israelites, when they went into the promised land, they were practically commanded to hate the Canaanites and the Amalekites. But actually they were never told to hate them. They were commissioned to destroy them. They had to go in and they had to go as an army and destroy this these peoples, which, which they did to a large extent. Now, the fault of the scribes and the teachers of the law and perhaps the rabbis were following those ideas as well, was that they stereotyped the law. Now, with the law with regards to specific events where the Israelites were told to go and destroy an opposition, to totally destroy them because they were in the promised land and God had given them the promised land, what happened there was transitory in nature. They had to go in and do that, and then they had to live normally again. So that was a transitory situation. It wasn't a permanent situation explaining the way that they permanently lived. And so the scribes extended this transitory situation, twisted it a little bit, and they kept it going in the wrong direction by making it the plea for indulgence in private enmities. In other words, it gave you permission to have private enemies <laughs> and still be within the law of God. Wow. So, so I suppose you could say, well, that's really stretching it a bit. But that's what they were teaching in the synagogues. So our Lord Jesus Christ comes and he cancels all the rabbinic and the scribe, all the gloss as regards the national 
neighborhood towards people who just believe the same as you and allowing private hatreds. And instead, Jesus teaches us to strive after the ideal in which everybody on this earth is our neighbor and we love everybody. And to seek the good of those who have shown us the most bitter hostility to love them. Now, I'm sure you might have experienced that people have done bad things to you in your life, as I've experienced. And I think many people have got the same situation where people have done bad things to them. And now we've been asked to love these people. <laughs> now, I just want to give you an example about something that happens like this. That Jesus is talking to a young man and he's giving him advice on how to love his neighbor and this comes from Luke chapter 10 verses 30 to 37 verse 30 and Jesus answering said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And verse 33. Sorry, verse 32. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. Verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. Verse 34. And he went to him and bound up his wounds pouring in oil and wine and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Verse 35. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him. And whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Verse 36. Which now of these three thinkest thou was the neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? Verse 37. And he said, he that showed mercy on him, then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thy likewise. That's the end of that passage of scripture. So we can see that this man who was wounded and attacked by thieves was, was a Jewish person. And the first to come by was a priest. Now, this priest was obviously very highly respected and from the Levi lineage, and he was able to give sacrifices in the temple. Very, very Jewish. Very much, you could say, he was the neighbor of this person who had been attacked. But when he came by there, he passed by on the other side. He didn't want to get too close to this, this person. And then a Levi, also highly respected, very much his neighbor, <laughs> came and actually looked at him. He didn't just pass by on the other side, but he actually came in closer and looked at him. And then he passed by on the other side. He didn't want to get too close. And then a Samaritan came, somebody who was his enemy, not his friend or neighbor, his enemy. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and he helped him. 
he showed him love. So that is such a beautiful story of somebody giving love to the enemy. We are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, but to broaden the concept of neighbor from just the people we know and love and who love us to everybody that is our neighbor. I just want to give you another example of the way that Jesus Christ displayed love for his neighbor. Not that it was his neighbor as a man to a man, because Jesus Christ is God, but even so, he gave this illustration. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And now this comes from a verse where he's being crucified, and such terrible things have been done to him, and he shows his persecutors, he shows them love. I think this is from Luke chapter 23, not 100% sure. And we go from verse 33 to 35. I've just given a verse before and a verse afterwards, just to give a little bit of context. Verse 33. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, there they crucified him. And the male factors one on the right hand side and the other on the left. Verse 34, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. Verse 35, and the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them derided him saying, he saved others, let him save himself. And if he be Christ, the chosen of God. The end of the verse. So there we can see that Jesus had been crucified on the cross. There had been many things done to him that were all wrong. And yet he still showed love to them. So we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We are to love our neighbors as Jesus Christ loves us. Wow, that is, that is difficult. I'm not going to argue about that. It's difficult. But that's what Jesus Christ is saying in the Sermon on the Mount about love. We don't have the right to hate our enemy. We ought to love our enemy because our enemies are our neighbors. Now, let me just read that verse again. Matthew 5, verse 43. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. End of the verse. Now let's just look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, end of the verse. Wow. <laughs> so we start the verse, part of that verse, and we're just going to take this little snippet out of, out of the verse. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. That's the end of that extract. Now, it's quite interesting to note that the latter words, in other words, the words do good to them that hate you, are admitted from some of the ancient manuscripts, especially the manuscripts that aren't 
um, considered to be the correct manuscripts. We won't get into that now. But some of the more recent editors of the Holy Scriptures, of the Holy Bible, they've actually come to the view, and whether it's correct or not, that's another discussion. But they've actually claimed that these words were inserted in the 4th or the 5th century into the manuscripts so as to bring the verse into verbal agreement with Luke chapter 6 verse 28. So there is something to really drill down into and study. Thankfully, in the King James Version of the Bible, we have the whole thing. Bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you. So we haven't lost that in the King James Version of the Bible. And let's look at, let's read Luke chapter 6, verse 28. Bless them that curse you, and pray for them which despitefully use you. End of the verse. So, let's take this verse as it stands here. So, I'm just going to read that verse again, just so we get it fresh in our minds. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. End of the verse. So the first thing of interest is the extension of the command to love our neighbor so that it includes even those people that we have a natural impulse to hate. Maybe we hate them because they are enemies and they've done things to us. And because of them, we are compromised in so many different ways. But yet we are asked to love them as well. <laughs> okay. So, so let's look at some of the original words from the Old Testament, how they were worded just to understand how the scribes and that twisted it a little bit in the way they taught it in the synagogues. We go back to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Thou shalt not avenge, nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people, but thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. I am the Lord, the end of the verse. And then the second point I'd like to make about this verse, and I'd just like to get a little extract out of the verse again, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Okay. So, here we see that the stress is laid on prayer as the highest utterance of that love. So now, how do you tell your enemies that you love them? Well, it seems that the most powerful way, the highest way to do that, is to pray for them. <laughs> Now, that we can do. I'm sure we can do that. In such cases, circumstances may preclude X, which could be rejected. So if you're trying to show love to your enemies, and you go and you do little things, maybe you knock on your neighbor's door, who happens to be your arch enemy, and you have a tray of muffins, and you think, you know, I thought I'd just bring you this because I just thought you'd like them for whatever reason. And if they know that you're, they are your enemy, they hate you, you hate them, and yeah, you're standing with a tray of muffins, <laughs> they may reject it and tell you where you can, what you can do with those muffins. And the kind words that you give to them they might be met with 
scorn. So you might give them love in kind words, but they may cut those words off and scorn you. But if you pray for them, then they can't stop you from praying and for saying the things that you really need to say. That they can't stop that. And you can pray that you may be delivered from the evil which has been their curse because of that hatred between the two of you. So that curse has always been a sort of a power over you. So you can pray to Lord Jesus Christ, to God the Father, that he would break that and, and make you, allow you to love this person. Allow you to love this person through prayer. And in praying to God about loving this person who hates you or that you formerly hated, but now they're your neighbor, you love them. We're actually drawing closer to God and we are aligning ourselves with the mind of God. We are aligning our will, our personal will. Remember, we have freedom of will in this world with the will of God. So we are aligning our will with the will of God in just in making that prayer. And we're asking God that our wills will be as his will. That his will be done in our lives. We're going to align ourselves. So always remember when you're trying to give love to your enemies that we can say the words to them that we really mean and the words that we know to be right. But these words may be rejected by the people around us and just give them an opportunity to attack us some more. However, if we take what the scripture teaches and we pray these words, especially if we pray silently to ourselves, then nobody can object to our words. And a little trick that I've learned is if you can't say something to somebody and you say, let's pray about it and you can pray about those exact same words that you would have said to them. Maybe that's not quite the right way to go, but it's just something to remember as well. So God can approve of our words because we are doing what God says we must do. Even if the people that we're saying these words to reject them, God will accept them if it's in line with the scripture. So what a beautiful thought that is. I'm just going to read that verse again. Matthew 5 verse 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. End of verse. <laughs> Very powerful stuff. A sermon on the mount. <laughs> He's talking about love. And now let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. End of the verse. If you look at the words, that ye may be, that ye may be. So the whole verse is, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Okay, just that snippet. That ye may be. So literally, that ye may be. And with a far fuller meaning, that ye may be, that ye may become. We cannot become like God in power and in wisdom, but we can align ourselves to God's will. So the attempt at that likeness to the Godhead was the cause of man's fall. In other words, we fell into sin. The devil sinned in heaven 
and was cast onto earth, Eve was tempted and fell into sin along with Adam. Now, you've probably wondered if the devil wasn't there to tempt Eve and Adam and cause them to sin, would they have fallen into sin? What do you think? <laughs> or would they have sinned in any case? We like to think that they wouldn't have fallen into sin. But anyway, that, that is something else. So trying to be like the God, it like God, trying to be as a created being of God, as much like God as possible, which was the very thing that eventually originally caused man to fall and can lead to a similar issue these days. But we cannot make that error if we strive to be like God the Father. We strive to be like him in his love. So in other words, if we try to be like God, in the same way that God loves us, we try to love God and other people, in that way we can't fall into error. I just like to quote an example by the Apostle Paul. And if you look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. That's the end of that verse. And the love which we are to reproduce is not primarily that of which the kingdom of God are the direct objects showing itself in pardon. We're trying to pardon the people who've done wrong to us because they may become a child or of the kingdom of God. They may become born again Christians. And just by loving all those people, we're giving them in a way or opening them up to spiritual blessings and ourselves as well to spiritual blessings. It works both ways. <laughs> when you align yourself with God, amazing things happen. Now, we assume, and we can assume, and I think rightly so, that the sunshine and the rain and the fruitful seasons in summer and that where we have fruit on our trees are the gift of our Father in heaven and the proof of his loving purpose for us. And I think it is a gift. Now, to just get a little bit off track here, but I think it's important just to understand this, and I'm going to dip a little bit into philosophy for a while, with your permission, of course. The teaching of the higher Stoics present a close to verbal parallel. So what the Stoics had taught was strangely a very close verbal parallel and they had arrived at this by the best and the most brilliant philosophers of their time and we're looking at a few hundred years BC um, when the Stoics really started getting going but there's a lot of problems with the Stoics but I just want to quote this because it's interesting that, that the words are pretty close so, quote, and this quote is from the first century book of philosophy on Stoic philosophy and ethics. And I just want to see if I have the, okay, I didn't get the actual verse, or I haven't written it down yet, but it actually comes from chapter two, and I think it's the sixth paragraph. Okay. So the quote, if thou wouldest 
imitate the gods, do good even to the unthankful, for the sun rises even on the wicked, and the seas are open to pirates. That's the end of that quote. <laughs> and you may think to yourself, wow, that's such a mind-blowing teaching, and it sort of almost aligns with the Holy Scriptures in a way. Almost. Almost aligns. Doesn't align completely. <laughs> now, if you look at Stoicism, it is a branch of philosophy. It was actually a very early philosophy before the great Greek or, or Roman philosophers really came into their own. So Stoicism began around the year 304 BC, and it has absolutely nothing to do with Christianity. <laughs> it was, in fact, a branch of philosophy that was ultimately supported by the Roman emperors. It was a branch of heathen philosophy. It's a branch of Hellenic philosophy. And so it's so far away from Christianity, it's not even funny. <laughs> but I just brought that in because the parallel is so mind-blowing. You know, where did they get that? Where, where did it come from? Now, just to tell you a little bit about Stoic philosophy, okay, we are working towards becoming born-again Christians. Well, we are born-again Christians, and we focus in on Jesus Christ. And so we don't want to waste any time on this, but let me just quickly wrap up what I've been saying. Stoic philosophy carries the four virtues of Stoicism, and this is sort of the central to all of their philosophy, these four virtues or principles, and that is courage, temperance, justice, and wisdom. And I think let me finish talking about it right there. We don't have to study this stuff, but it's just interesting that the pagan philosophy would sort of almost parallel for a small point in time what Jesus Christ was teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, it's just that one little verse, or one little saying anyway. Okay. But as you can see from the verse, Jesus gives us the teaching that we need. Okay. So we don't need to supplement it with the ancient Stoic philosophy or, or the later Greek philosophers or any of that stuff, because Jesus Christ already gives us all the philosophy we need and explains how to apply it. And I just want to read that verse again, Matthew 5, verse 45, that we've been looking at. Just maybe it means more when we read it again. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. End of the verse. And now if you look at Matthew 5, verse 46. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same? End of the verse. Okay, so what, who are these publicans and why is, are the publicans such a, a big deal that Jesus would say that even the publicans love them that, that love them, love those that love them? It's almost as though the publicans are something really bad. Okay. You may know who the publicans are, but I'm just going to do a little bit of a recap on the publicans. <laughs> okay, so we have to go back about 2,000 years. 
and sort of get into perspective what was happening at that point in time. So the publicans were tax collectors in Israel, but because Israel was under Roman rule, they were collecting taxes for Rome. <laughs> so the word publican came from the Ro Roman word publicani. The Jews detested the publicans and the work of tax collecting that they did. However, the Romans recruited Jewish people to be tax collectors. <laughs> Can you believe? So a Jew who became a publican was viewed as a betrayer to the Jewish nation. So if you listen to what they taught in the synagogues, yes, you could hate a publican. <laughs> okay, Jesus was saying you shouldn't hate your enemies, but a publican had become sort of a enemy to the Jewish people. So the Publicans were hated for the method of taking more from their own people than that which was required by Rome. And the difference between what Rome required and what they took was for their own additional profit besides the, the, the pay for the services that they provided. So as a result, Publicans were shunned from society. They were not allowed in the synagogue. And the Jewish people dealt with publicans as though they were heathen dogs. So obviously they hated the publicans. <laughs> now the Bible speaks of one such publican or tax collector who responded to Jesus and this this publican was able to respond to Jesus because Jesus spoke to him Jesus loved him <laughs> you see what a good example this is and this tax collector or publican responded to Jesus and he became a disciple or a follower of Jesus Christ Amen to that. Now, it's actually a very well-known ex-publican. <laughs> and we know this former publican as the Apostle Matthew, <laughs> or the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. The book of Matthew was a, Matthew was a publican. <laughs> So, we, we, it could be remarked that our Lord Jesus Christ puts himself, as it were, on the level of those people whom he speaks to. So, when he spoke to the Jewish people who were educated in the law, law of the Bible, he spoke on that level. And when he spoke to the publicans, he spoke to them on their level. So he adjusted the way he spoke according to his audience. The Jews despised the publicans as, as being well below them in stature. They weren't up to their standard, definitely not. And they almost regarded them as a sort of a pariah cost. In other words, as people who weren't equal to them. They were almost subhuman in a way. That's how they regarded the publicans. But Jesus Christ was prepared to speak to all classes of people, and that included publicans <laughs> and Pharisees and, and so on. And Jesus pointed out that if you only love those people that love you, then are you really any better than the publicans because the publicans also love those people that love them and that's such a beautiful point it's it's so good let, let me just read that verse again matthew chapter 5 verse 46 for if ye love them which love you what reward have ye 
do not even the publicans the same? It's the end of the verse. So now let's go to the next verse, Matthew chapter 5, verse 47. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publican so? End of the verse. <laughs> and again, the comparison to those that they absolutely hated, the publicans. Okay, so if ye salute your brethren. So this was something that was part of their culture, which is not part of our culture anymore these days. But the prominence of salutation in the social life of the East gives a special vividness to this concept or this precept to utter the formal peace be with you and to follow that up by manifold compliments and wishes was to recognize those whom men saluted as friends and brothers. So to salute your brethren wasn't just to say, salute you, my brother, and, and that was it. <laughs> but it was a whole speech, I, I suppose, a, a, a sort of a, a short speech. And you start off with, peace be with you, and then to go into a whole lot of compliments and best wishes for this person. And that was a salutation. We don't do it anymore. It's not our custom. And it doesn't really matter. That, but that's what Jesus Christ was, was talking about. But what Jesus Christ was trying to say when he said, don't even the publicans do that, because they were not really Jewish people anymore. They were not true believers of the Jewish religion anymore once they become a publican. And so talking about the publicans in a way, it was as though Jesus was talking about the heathens or, or the unbelievers. And what he was saying is, but even the heathens and the non-believers, they salute their brothers. So you salute your brother in a beautiful way and the heathen do it as well. How are you better than the heathen? So were the followers of Jesus Christ to be content with copying heathen customs? What do you think? <laughs> so Jesus Christ is edging us towards doing more than just loving the people that are close to us and those people that love us and saluting, like giving a proper oratory, a little speech when you meet somebody, to salute them with a whole paragraph of compliments. Um, we need to do more than that because the heathen or the publicans are doing that as well. So Jesus is just urging us, look, you got to do more than that to show love to your enemies. Let me just read that verse again. Matthew chapter 5 verse 47, and if you salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publican so? It's the end of the verse. <laughs> so in a way, what Jesus is saying is, if you could salute your enemies, greet them with a great pomp and ceremony and compliments can you do that to your enemy that traditional east um, eastern cultural salute then you would be doing more than just the heathen do let's listen now to a beautiful piece of music oh holy night by john 